Okay, good morning everybody. I know I was supposed to do this teaching later on tonight when it was live, but um, I have some things I have to do today, so I'm going to record it a little bit early. So hopefully anyone who's up and is watching this now um, can be benefited from it. And also anyone who just who watches it at the time of, I think it's six o'clock, um, you'll be benefited as well. So I'm going to go ahead and just give a couple minutes for people to tune in who maybe will wait. And also at the six o'clock time, just give a couple minutes for um, anyone else at six o'clock to kind of catch in as well who may be tuning in. But um, in the meantime, my name is Nate and this is BCF Bethel Campus Fellowship. Um, Bethel Campus Fellowship is campus ministry that is located on different a wide variety of college campuses and we lead students to Christ and help them become reliable men and women of God or who God can entrust with his word for the next generation. So we raise up leaders um, through the power of Christ and um, by the Holy Spirit we, we teach other young men and women how to become leaders in Christ so that they can lead on their campus, in their community, even in the workplace and in their family. Wherever they are, they can just reflect the glory of who God is. Um, a couple of events that we have coming up, I know we have the National Proclaim, which will be held in the, the Baltimore, D.C. area. Um, I can't. I think it's the Showplace Arena, and it is free. Um, the registration is free, and it's just going to be an event where we're trying to get thousands of college students to come together and just really pro, um, proclaim the, the glory of God just to, and take just glorify God in everything that we do and just really just worship him and just um, make a declaration that that there are some true believers, especially um, among the young generation who is here, that still have a passion for God and have a desire to live according to his word. So I think that would be pretty powerful. And another event that's coming up is the National Conference, which we have every year. So it's annual and it's in February. Currently the cost is $210 which is actually not bad for a conference. Um, it covers your room and board, it covers your food and all of the conference materials. And this is one of the best conferences I've ever been to, like period. I've been to quite a few um, Christian conferences, but um, this national conference that BCF has is something that is just life changing and it can really open you up to see a lot of things that, um, um, a lot of things from God that you may not either have experienced or you may have not experienced for a while, um, and it kind of gets you refreshed. But with all that being said, I think that's been a few minutes. So I'm just going to go ahead and pray um, and just, you know, ask God to come and take over. I'm um, just rebuke any distractions or anything that Satan will try to do, you know, because he, he's, he loves doing that. Um, but we have power over him. We have power over his demons. And... He don't want us to know that because when we know that, then he knows that he has no power. The Bible teaches us in James that if we resist the devil, he will flee. So that means all we got to do is submit to God, live according to his word, and resist the enemy. And Satan will flee from us because by submitting to God, we are recognizing that who we are as children of God and the authority that Christ has given in us. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to get started on tonight's topic. Um, tonight's topic is that atheist professor. And when I saw this topic, I was excited to talk about it because I've actually had a couple of encounters with some atheist professors. Um, yeah, so I'm going to pray and then we'll get started. All right, so dear Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, God, just glorify you and worship you, God, and just love you for who you are, God. Just thank you for the many blessings which you um, place before us daily, God. Just thank you for the clothes that we have to wear, the food that we have to eat, God, the opportunities before us, Father God, the jobs that we may have. Um, the different resources that you provide for us, God, just a, the chance to be in school, Father God, our family and friends, Father God, that you have um, sent our way to uh, to be blessings to us, Father God, and the people that you allow us to be blessings to, God. I just pray that you um, seize control of this teaching. God, just let me be a cemented vessel for your Holy Spirit to speak through and to flow through in the name of Jesus Christ, God. I pray that you bind up my words and let me not speak anything of my flesh, God, but let only the words of your Holy Spirit come through, Father God, pure and unadulterated in the name of Jesus Christ. I rebuke any um, distractions right now, any snares or, um, or fiery darts which Satan will try to send to cause any issues. Father God, any technical issues, Father, we just rebuke them all in the name of Jesus Christ, God. Um, let everything just flow. 
um, clearly, God, let there be no confusion, Father God, and let there um, let everything that is said um, according to your word be good seed, Father God. Just prepare the hearts and the minds of those who have received this word to be good ground, Father God, and just send others to water these seeds that are sown, Father God, and just give the increase and grow this, um, the, and just allow fruit to be born from 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 the the seeds that are sown today. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. All right, so if you see me look to my right, it's because my laptop is right there. And that's kind of where I have my little outline. Um, yeah, so in school, in college, high school, even in the workplace, we know that when it comes down to Christianity, there's a lot of people who claim Christianity. And then there's a lot of people who don't claim Christianity. There's a lot of people who flat out just disagree with anything. So what happens is, as believers in Christ, sometimes we we forget that there are people out there who don't really like the God that we serve, which is the one true living God. And his son is Jesus Christ who came in the flesh. Um, he died for our sins and he resurrected as proof that um, he is the son of the living God. And it also proved to us that if he resurrected, we'll be resurrected on Judgment Day as well. You know what I'm saying? So that's the blessing and that's the, the, the faith that we hold on to, that hope in Christ and that confidence we have in Christ um, for the salvation that he's brought to us through the blood that he shed on the cross. So when we hold true to these things, there are other people who do not receive these things. They do not, re, um, they do not accept them. And they reject these truths. And because they reject these truths, they reject us as well. So the confidence that we have to have in Christ is that we're, we're, we're right where we're supposed to be. I don't know if that makes sense. So I'm going to start off by going to a couple of scriptures that kind of gives the foundation. Because a lot of times, sometimes, sometimes believers don't know why non-believers don't like us. Or why non-believers don't really understand what we're talking about. So the first scripture that I want us to go to is actually is First Corinthians chapter two, and it's verse fourteen. But I'm actually gonna read. I'm actually gonna start at the beginning of First Corinthians chapter two because all of this is really edifying and it all really sets the um the foundation for everything that we're gonna talk about. So in First Corinthians chapter two. It starts off, and this is New King James. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's a powerful verse, verse 5. You should mark that if you don't have it marked. And really just ask God to reveal that to you in a deeper understanding. Um, in Jesus' name. So starting at verse 6, or continuing at verse 6, it says, However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the, of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God and the mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for those who love him. That's beautiful, right? Verse 10, But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. So this is key. This is why people can't read. This is why people reject the truth of what we hold in Christ. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So we understand these things because of the Holy Spirit that God gave to us. And it's not a Spirit of the world. It's a Spirit that comes from God. So one thing that, exempt, that that distinguishes a child of God from someone who is a child of Satan or someone who is in a, a member of the world and not of the body of Christ is the children of God have received God's Spirit. We have received His Holy Spirit, which allows us to have a, a true understanding of, of who God is, um, who Christ is, and what salvation means. 
So I'll continue on. It says, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So when it comes to being on a college campus, or in the workplace, or, or any type of situation as a believer in Christ, one thing that we have to always understand is that the reason that people will disagree with what we say is because if they don't have the Holy Spirit, they can't comprehend the things that we're talking about. They can't comprehend the vastness of God. Like even us ourselves in our flesh and in our finite mind, we can't fully comprehend the 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 weight of God's glory, of who God really is and all of these other these other great attributes of God. It takes God's Holy Spirit for us to even be able to have some type of understanding of who he is, which is why he has to first reveal himself to us before we can even come close to him. Does that make sense? So one thing we have to understand is that if if, the, if these people don't have the Holy Spirit, they're not going to fully understand the things that we're talking about. And that's one reason why we can see that Christ spoke in so many parables. He had to take spiritual things and place it into concrete, carnal, natural things so that people without the Spirit could grasp a hold of the spiritual things and then eventually become receptive to where they could be placed in a position for their hearts to be opened by God to receive God. Does that make sense? So that is one thing that we deal with not only on our campuses but also in our, our personal lives, um, whether it's family on a workplace or anything like that. Um, so in light of that scripture, I also want us to jump over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want us to read verse 18. It says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the, to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Praise God. So what's the beautiful thing about this is these two passages that we have read, it just explains the reason for everything when it comes to dealing with people who are non-believers in Christ, people who reject the truth about God, and people who, who dub themselves as agnostic or atheist or all of these other different terms. What it comes down to is the fact that um, these people are operating in the wisdom of man. They are operating in demonic wisdom. Some of them are just operating in bitterness or unforgiveness, or they have some type of enmity towards God because of a lack of understanding that is there. Um, in all of my personal experiences and just different discussions with a lot of different people, I noticed that there tends to be a lack of understanding. There team, excuse me, there, team, there tends to be some type of false teaching or, or, or misinterpreted scripture that they've come across from someone who didn't really know what they were talking about. It has led them astray and got them bogged down in confusion or not really understanding who God is to the point where they just reject them altogether because they can't they can't see the love that God really has for us. They can't see how chastisement is love. They can't see how a loving God who gave us free will and in a lot of words of other people would let all this bad stuff happen. And it's like that stuff like that is because they just don't have God's spirit to really understand those concepts. So when it comes to dealing with um, with atheist professors, because that's actually the topic, um, what happens is we have to operate in the wisdom of God. Um, and we know that the Bible teaches us that fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And we know that the Bible teaches us to... Um, so it says with all our getting to get understanding. So when it comes to dealing with wisdom with these type of professors, the first thing that we have to have is that that fear of God has to be the foundation. That reverence and that respect and that honor for God and our personal lives has to be the foundation of everything we do. Because if we don't have that fear of God, if we don't have that wisdom 
um, of, of God that the, that the Bible calls wisdom, then what happens is we set ourselves up for failure. Because if we don't have that, that correct reverence and, and fear and respect for God, that love for God, then what happens is we put ourselves in a position to where we can operate in a fear to man. I don't know if that makes sense. So what happens is if we don't have a correct fear of God, then it puts us in position to have a fear of man, which will cause us to become compromising in our walk because we become people pleasers and we begin fearing man more than we fear God. We respect the opinion of man more than we respect the opinion of God. We respect the 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 feelings of man more than we respect the feelings of God. We respect the way that people view us more than we respect the way that God views us. I hope that makes sense. So just a little um I got two testimonies about dealing with two um two atheist professors. Um one was my freshman year when I first got to school and is when I was in my landscape architecture class and my professor was actually to my knowledge she didn't have a belief in God or if he did have a belief in God he just rejected him altogether and so when he is funny because when he discovered that I was a Christian or when he dis he discovered that I was a follower of Christ he used to say little slick comments um in his lectures after he had discovered that before then he just talked about the certain topics but after he found out my stance and my faith in, in what I believed in and what he did was he started nitpicking and making comments here and making comments there um, and, and at first you know it used to kind of irritate me a little bit because I didn't understand why he was doing it because I was fresh in the faith I was a babe in Christ I didn't really know like how to handle it so for the first, for the most part, the first thing I would, I would do, I didn't do anything. I just sat there in class and was quiet. And then I would have conversations with God and be like, okay, God, well, what do I do? Should I say something? How does this work? And all this other stuff like that. Like I'm trying to figure out what should I do as a Christian who is feeling, who is feeling this, this, this subtle form of persecution through these, um, these subtle words and these subtle attacks. You know what I'm saying? Because that's how the devil works. He, he tries to come subtly all the time. You know what I'm saying? Um, but it was in a process of that where it's funny because one of the first assignments that the teacher gave us was to write a paper on the beginning, like on evolution, on, on the beginning of the world and things like that. And what's funny to me is if it's a landscape architecture class, why are we writing about evolution or how things began? And why are we watching movies about evolution of, of, of mankind from monkeys and different things like that? So, but the funny thing is, is God still was able to flip it because what happened is I went and got my word. Cause when I first came to Christ, I was praying, I was fasting, just watching sermons and everything. Like I, I was really seeking after God hard, um, probably more than I've ever sought after him in my life. So even when this situation came up and this assignment was given to me, the first thing I did was I went straight to God and I said, okay, God, I said, this man is trying to make a fool out of me and also trying to make a mockery out of you. So I need your help on how to deal with this situation. And I asked God to, to give me the words to say, and I just asked him for his help. And sometimes when it comes to dealing with people, with professors or, or, or managers or anybody who, who are non-believers, if we don't know what to do, the first thing that we should always do is go directly to God and ask God for help because in those situations, we don't really know what to do. And if we don't seek God for his help, if we don't seek God for his wisdom, what we end up doing is we begin, we begin operating in the wisdom of man. You know what I'm saying? So what happens is instead of us fighting in the spiritual realm and like praying and asking God to like break any spirits that may be operating in the background, and instead of asking God to give us the words to say, we start saying words that we believe are right, things that we feel will work. And what happens is we start working on our own accord. We start working operating out of our flesh instead of operating out of the spirit of God that is within us. Because if you ever notice when Christ would deal with the Pharisees and the scribes, they would always try to trip him up. They'd always try to um, accuse him of, of breaking the law. They would always try to accuse him of doing something or try to get him to look like a fool, try to make him um, become a mockery in the eyes of the people. But one thing that was very profound that I, that I love about Christ 
Um, and you can you can study a lot about evangelism just through observing Christ, you know what I'm saying, and just how to deal with, with non believers by observing Christ. Because what he would do is like this is this is the wisdom of God. They would ask Jesus a question and Jesus would give them an answer that was just so ill that they always got quiet. You know what I'm saying? And they would either get upset to the point where like I know one time he had to flee because he said it said he perceived that they wanted to put their hands on him and things like that. But it just comes down to the point of like when it when when it's something that the spirit of God is dealing with, um, as and within that person, God will give you the exact words to say that will not only glorify him, but it will kill any argument or anything that's being said. Because it tells us right here, it says in First Corinthians chapter one. At verse 20, it says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those people. But verse 20 is the key. He says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? So when we go to God and we ask God to give us the words to speak when we are in, in a situation when people are who, who do not believe in God, who reject God, are trying to make a mockery of us, what happens is the wisdom of God will rise up in us and it will give an answer that they can't contend with. It will give them an answer that will make them go home and think. It will give them an answer that will make them want to start avoiding you when you raise your hand in class. It will give, it will, the Holy Spirit will provide you with an answer that will make them um, not call on you, that will make them try to avoid certain topics because they don't want to get involved in that conversation with you. And I don't know if this is making sense, but I'm just kind of going off of what the scripture said and just also what I've experienced personally. So back to the story, what happened is, so as I prayed and I asked God, I got on um I got on the internet and I didn't just start typing the paper. The first thing I did was I went to Bible Gateway and I just started like researching a lot of different scriptures as far as creation and different things like that, which and I'm actually thankful for the professor because he really motivated me to get deeper in my word. And so I started not just with my thoughts and my ideas. What I started with was I started with the word of God. And that's what we always want to start with when it comes to dealing with these situations. Analyze, um, seek God's help, seek his wisdom and analyze his word and see and find his guidance and his instruction from his word because the word is the absolute truth. People can try to argue against it, refute it, whatever they want to say, but um, time and time again, the word of God has stood the test through years, centuries, like thousands of years, it's still here. And it's being and it's like it's confirmed, at least in my knowledge, as absolute truth. No matter what anyone tries to say to disprove this, no matter if they try to highlight contradictions or whatever, because the Bible has no contradictions. If there's a a, a quote unquote contradiction in the Bible, it's because somebody's understanding is off of the scripture that they're reading because God's word confirms it itself through other passages in the Bible. You know what I'm saying? And if there's a passage in the Bible that isn't confirmed somewhere else, you have to check the understanding of the person that's given that because God's word does not contradict itself. God does not go against himself. Does that make sense? So anyways, so I started off in the word. I started off and then I started writing the paper. And the funny thing is, out of everyone, I ended up being, I ended up writing an eight page paper when it was only supposed to be two pages. And the teacher got it. And he got he gave us grace and everything like that. But what happened is he tried to make another mockery of me by doing this. No other t no other student in the class did he do this to. He asked me to come to the front of the class and read my paper. And I believe that he asked me to come to the front of the class and read my paper because he thought it was foolish. Because the Bible right here just told us that the w the wisdom of God is foolishness to man. You know what I'm saying? So he thought that. It was going to make me look crazy in front of the class. He thought it was going to look, make me look foolish. So I stood up there in front of the class, and I'm not going to lie, I was nervous. Like, I started, I started having doubts in my heart, like, dang, God. Like, I was bold on this paper. You know, now I kind of understand what Paul meant when he was like, they might say that he's bold in paper, but, like, he's, he's timid in speech when he's in their face, you know? So it was like, on the paper, like, I was going in. 
quote of scriptures. Then I went and got like the facts that support the scriptures and everything like that, and just highlighted that throughout the whole paper. When I had to get in front of the class, I was actually nervous. But the funny thing is, after I finished reading the paper, the whole class started clapping. And I went and talked to my professor, and I said, "I said you was trying to make me look, um, you was trying to make me look like a fool." And he he just responded, and he was like, "He's like, nah, I I really thought it was a good paper, but I don't know." And to me, in my understanding, I believe that he really was trying to make me look a fool. But the beautiful thing is, at the end of the day, I got an A minus on the paper. So there, there may be times that it may seem difficult when dealing with professors like that. But the the the, the key is remain firm in your faith and remain founded in the Word of God, and don't falter and don't stumble because sometimes these things are just tests. Sometimes there, there are temptations from the enemy to try to cause us to, to blaspheme God or to deny Christ in front of others. But um, oftentimes there are tests from God to, to show us the genuineness of our faith. And so one thing, one scripture I want to go to that's going to kind of shed some light on that is in Deuteronomy. Um, and it is Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 13. Let me see. Yeah, okay, so it's Deuteronomy chapter 13. And let's go to, we'll read verses 3 and 4. It says, <coughs> excuse me. It says, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. The beautiful thing about that scripture is it highlights the fact that sometimes God will allow like false prophets or false teachers or he'll allow us to have these encounters with people who don't believe to, to, to see where our heart is with him. To see if we'll remain like even if we don't have all the words to say at that time even if we don't have the best testimony that we feel can get somebody um closer to god or anything like that sometimes god will allow us to be in those situations to see where our heart is with him he's trying to see if we're still going to stand firm and hold firm to the faith or if we're going to fold and give in to the pressures or the persecutions that are coming upon us whether it's it's a subtle persecution or just flat out open persecution and sometimes when we say persecution um we kind of belittle it over here in America, you know what I'm saying? But there is real persecution in other portions of the world. But over here, you know what I'm saying? There's still persecution just in different manners, at least for the time being, um, as prophecy is unfolding itself. So in a situation like that, we always have to stand firm and hold firm to our faith in God because as long as we endure that test and we come out of it, then we come out of it stronger and God is glorified. So at the end of the day, even with that um that professor, that guy was still glorified because without him realizing it, the truth that was in that paper that he tried to use to make me look like a fool when it came up in um when it came to me speaking in front of the class just to read that paper, what he actually ended up doing was God had put me in a position to pretty much minister to the whole class just by reading the scriptures and the verses that he had given me the wisdom to put in that paper. Has that made sense? So I guess when it comes to um, one fact, uh, uh, another aspect of dealing with the atheist professor is just being patient, um, being patient and operating in, in the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit that deals with that, that patience and, and that long suffering. Because there are going to be some times where you get frustrated, but at the same time, we can't let that frustration get the best of us that cause us to act out of character because Satan wants to get us to slip, especially if there's other people in the class who recognize you to be a believer in Christ because as soon as you identify yourself as a believer in Christ, for some reason, if you if you ever pay attention and notice it, the world marks you. And the world marks you and they look at everything you do because they want to see how true you are to the word. And the funny thing is, as little as some non-believers know about the Word of God, as a Christian, when you do something that's a contradicting to the Word of God, it's like the spirits that, that, that are operating with them are quick to call you out on it. And to me, I believe God allows that to happen because it's a way of, it's a way of keeping us in check. And it's a, it's a way of 
allowing us to make sure that we're on point because the world knows what the world looks like and the world knows that if you're supposed to be a Christian or you're supposed to be a believer in Christ then you shouldn't look like they look. You shouldn't be doing the things that they're doing. You shouldn't be saying what they're saying. You shouldn't be listening to what they're listening to. You shouldn't be watching what they're watching. Like it's a degree of separation that even the most adamant non-believer recognizes that when you call yourself a Christian they looking at you to see if you're going to resemble them or if you're going to truly resemble Christ. And a lot of times that's what happens when we deal with atheist professors. They're, they're, trying to put a, they're trying to put us in a position, like really it's like a fiery child. They're trying to put us in a position that makes us uncomfortable enough to where we deny Christ in front of everyone else in the class. Does that make sense? So I want to go to the next scripture, which is Matthew chapter 5. Um, verse 11, and then we're also going to go to Luke chapter 6, verses 22. And um, I hope this is making sense. I don't know how good it's flowing. Um, I know sometimes I kind of just go a little bit, but I promise it all ties back in the end. So Matthew chapter 5, and it's verse 11. It says, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Um, and actually, let's keep. Let's go to verse thirteen through sixteen, because this is this is another beautiful thing that Christ is telling us. He says, "You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned?" It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So sometimes when we are placed in these positions where we deal with non-believers or, or with these atheist professors or, or bosses or anything, wherever we are, what we, what we have to recognize is that Christ tells us that we're the salt of the earth, like we're the flavor, we're, we're the city on the hill, we're, we're a lamp in this world full of darkness. And the whole reason that we're, we are recognized as these things is because Christ now dwells in us, and as Christ dwells in us, we're supposed to be in a position where we allow Christ to shine in every aspect of our life. And even when Satan comes and attacks us, we need to recognize that that's a blessing, because it shows that where 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 we need to be, and we're trying to um, as long as it's for the sake of God, you know what I'm saying? Because in verse eleven it says, "For my sake." So if you're being persecuted, but it's not for the sake of God, it's just for the sake of you want to to be a part of the world, and they're not accepting you, things like that. Like that's a whole other story. And I say that because I've encountered a lot of people who are persecuted, but it's not for righteousness' sake. They're not being persecuted. Or, or look down upon her or being outcast because they're seeking the kingdom of God or they're seeking the righteousness of God or they're striving to look less like the world and look more like Christ. They're just being persecuted simply because they don't like they're not fitting in. Like they're trying to to, to to they're trying to fit in with the world, but they still stand out because they're not supposed to fit in with the world. So when they're persecuted for that reason, then they try to it's a whole nother story, you know what I'm saying? But just understand there's a difference in being persecuted for righteousness sake and being persecuted for the sake of God than just being persecuted. Does that make sense? So, anyways, come back to verse 16. It says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So what that means is that as he glo as you as you do these things for God, as you live and hold fast to the, the truth of God's word, and even as you you resist these attacks from the enemy through professors and through bosses and through co-workers and whoever, what happens is um and we're in Matthew chapter five on um, verses thirteen through sixteen, um so what happens is you're glorifying God in everything, and as you glorify God, then God be God is pleased because that's the purpose that we have in believers to glorify God. By the love that we have for him and the love that we show to others and the way that we conduct ourselves, even in these trying situations. So keep that in mind um, as far as us being a light. But I also want us to jump over to Luke chapter 6 verse 22. Alright, in Luke chapter 6 verse 22 it says, Blessed are you. 
when men hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day, leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their, prophet, their fathers did to the prophets. And the beautiful thing I love about this scripture right here is it continuously, it points us to have our minds set on heavenly things. Because as long as our mind is set on heavenly things, then we don't mind what we have to endure in this temporary life. One thing that's under, that we have to really know and have faith in and, and accept as a truth and believers in Christ is that this life is temporary. I don't care if you live to be 120 years old, that's still a small life compared to eternity. Because a million years from now in eternity, 120 years is going to be nothing. So we have to recognize that the things that we endure in our life now, the afflictions that we bear in our body now, like the things that we deal with, the I don't like the friends start like who you call your friends now or not your friends next year, or the closer you get to God, the more He pulls certain people out of your lives, the certain relationships He breaks off, certain things and ways He positions you, and ways that He shifts your life according to His purpose and plan as His child. We understand that. We're able to, to, to hold on to that and um, that promise that our reward in heaven will be great. And as we look to this hope and as we look to this promise, then the things that we deal with now, the things that we endure now, they become nothing. So this atheist professor that we may be encountering or these non-believers that we may encounter on our job or even in our families, like the stuff that they talk about, the things that they say and the things that they do and the ways that they try to cause us to be shamed are nothing. You know what I'm saying? And we have to have this understanding of where we're going because as long as we keep our focus on where we're going, then we know how to conduct ourselves where we currently are at. Does it make sense? Because if we truly believe in where we're going, then the way we conduct ourselves where we're at is going to line up with where we believe we're going. I don't know if that makes sense. But, yeah. So, what I want to do is I want us to go to another scripture which is in first Peter in this chapter three verse fourteen and first Peter chapter three verse fourteen it just kinda supports Luke chapter six um twenty two and Matthew chapter five eleven through thirteen. So we're gonna read first Peter three and I say three and fourteen but it might be a couple more scriptures because every time I get there I always see the other ones. And then um after I share this I'm gonna um it kind of explain my most recent situation I had with the atheist professor and just I believe this most recent situation I had as a mature believer in Christ is a lot different from when I was in my early stages and I had an encounter with the atheist professor all right so in first Peter chapter 3 verse 14 let's start at verse 13 it says and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake you are blessed, and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord your God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, it is the will of God, for, I'm sorry, for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than doing evil. So, this scripture is powerful because it confirms the other two scriptures that we just looked at. But it, it has verse 14. No, 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 no. Set verse 15. It says, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That means that God should be at a certain place in our heart that is reserved for no one else but Him. Which means that in a situation where people come against us and ask us, why we have? Why do we believe in Christ? Why do we have this hope for the promises of what the Word of God tells us? Why do we have these things? We need to have God set apart, so set apart in our heart that we are we are able to hear from Him and hear from His Holy Spirit to give us that 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 reason to combat what they're asking. You know what I'm saying? So when we sanctify God in our hearts. What it causes us to do is it, it causes us to have a genuine prayer life. It causes us to have a genuine devotional like daily, whether it's the morning, all throughout the day and the evening. It That God being sanctified in our heart causes us, by the nature of Christ within us, to study God's word. 
like unconditionally. It's not, I just feel good, so I'm going to read the word now. It's like, even when I don't feel like it, I'm still going to read the word. Even when I don't feel like it, I'm still going to pray. Even if I don't feel like it, if God is leading me to fast, I'm still going to fast. That's what it means when it says sanctify the Lord God in your heart. When God is sanctified and set apart in your heart from everything else, you know what I'm saying, that may be within your heart. When God holds that specific place above all other things, it causes you to have a strong prayer life, a strong fasting life, and a strong devotional life where you're spending time in the Word. And it's as you have this strong prayer life and as you have this, um, this lifestyle of fasting and as you have this time in God's Word, what happens is you, you, know, you have a strong defense for your faith because when people ask you things, the Holy Spirit is able to bring these things to your remembrance. As you're praying, you've already prayed and asked God to give you what you need for the day. So God is, already, God is equipping you with what you need to handle that day. When you're reading the word of God, you're, you're, you're feeding your spirit, man. You're, you're feeding your spirit, man, and not your flesh. And you're, you're, you're storing up. You're, you're hiding the word of God in your heart so that when it's necessary, the Holy Spirit can pull out of you what you have deposited in you through your prayer and through your time in God's word. And then fasting also allows you to be more receptive to the, to the spiritual things of God and allows you to be um, more subdued in your flesh so that you can be more submitted to the Holy Spirit. And as we're led by God's Holy Spirit, then when we find ourselves in these situations, there is no fear because there's a boldness that comes with having the Holy Spirit within us. And just to confirm that there's a boldness that comes through us by, because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, I want us to go to um, the book of Acts really fast. And as we go to the book of Acts, I want us to read chapter... We're going to read a few passages here in Acts. I'm sorry. But let us go to Let's go to chapter 4. And let's read thir verse 31. Um actually Acts chapter 4 verses 23 through 30. Um this is one thing that God has revealed to me and so I like to share it with everyone. Um, if you're struggling with boldness in the faith and you desire more boldness, go to Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 30, and personalize that and make that your prayer. And you'll notice that like, if you really sincerely believe that this, this, if you really sincerely believe in your heart when you pray this prayer, then you'll notice that the boldness will come. All right, but let's read verse 31. It says, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So, I don't want, I know some people get discouraged from, from like doing different things with discipleship and um, just evangelizing or doing different things with ministry on campus. One thing I notice is that some people, if they're not able to speak in um, tongues or if they're not able to, to operate in a certain gift that they feel a lot of other people operate in as, that, as a gift of the Holy Spirit, what happens is they doubt or they question whether they have the Holy Spirit. But I just want to let you know that there are different evidences of the fact that you have been filled with the Holy Spirit. And one thing that confirms it is right here in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. It says, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So one evidence that you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, or one evidence that the Holy Spirit is present within you, is that there's a certain boldness that comes with that. Because God fears no one. God fears no one. And if his Holy Spirit is in us and it comes to a situation, us ourselves, our flesh may be afraid, but the Spirit of God is not afraid. That's why the disciples and the early apostles were able to go through the things that they went through because they weren't afraid. Stephen, Stephen said what he said when he was filled with boldness. He died in boldness. You know like, you know how, you know how, just really think about that. Just think about the boldness that these disciples and apostles that walked with Christ that they had. When Christ was there, some of them were still timid and everything, but it's like when the Holy Spirit, because the Bible tells us that like when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, like we'll receive power. And it's like, this boldness is there. And so it's like when we deal with people who may be atheists or when we deal with these things, um, when we sanctify God in our hearts, um, according to 1 Peter 3, 
then we have God in a place where it causes us to pursue after God like he's our everything because he is. And as we pursue after God and as we seek after God, as we seek his kingdom and his righteousness and we stop pursuing all of these other things that we feel like we need, which we may need, but we don't have to pursue because the Bible teaches us that God will give these things to us if we just seek his kingdom and his righteousness. So as we seek his kingdom and his righteousness, as we get in his word, as we pray and as we fast, when we get in these situations with atheist professors or, or atheist boss or whoever, then God gives us everything we need to say because the Holy Spirit pulls the word out of us and the word of God is sharpened in any two-edged sword, which means that it's able to cut through everything. It cuts through everything. And when you really listen to some people who try to argue against God, they really sound foolish themselves. Because they are contradicting themselves because there are certain things that they desire to be accepted and there are certain things that desire us to accept. But there's certain, but if we do the same thing towards them, they don't want to accept it. You know what I'm saying? People will call you judgmental if you don't agree with um, things like homosexuality or sex outside of marriage, you know. And if you if you promote abstinence or celibacy and things like that, people look at you as being judgmental. However, if you talk about... However, when it comes to them telling you their beliefs on why they believe that um, homosexuality is cool or, or why they believe that sex outside of marriage is cool or why they believe smoking drugs and, and drinking alcohol is cool, they just want you to sit there and accept that. But when you come and you start talking about the word of God and the knowledge of God, and you start talking about the truth of this, uh, of this Bible, they don't want to hear that. But in the midst of all of that, we have the boldness of the Holy Spirit and we speak the truth anyways. So... With that, being, with that being said, this is the same way that we deal with these professors. However, we always just go to God first and we pray and ask God for his wisdom. Um, let's go to John chapter 11 verse 13. So John chapter 11. Verse 13. Sorry, John chapter 1. <laughs> Verse 11 through 13. Wow. Okay, look. So, let's start at verse. Let's start at verse 9. John chapter 1 verse 9. It says, That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The beautiful thing is in verse thirteen No 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 verse eleven it says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Alright, so hold that thought and we're gonna go to John chapter fifteen verses eighteen through twenty five. Because John John chapter one just told us that his own did not receive him. So John chapter fifteen Verses 18 through 25. It says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If you kept my word, they will keep yours also. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will say they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for the sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin, but now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. So this scripture right here, Christ is telling us that 
They already rejected me. They already hated me. They didn't want to receive the truth that I was bringing to them. So if they hated me for the truth that I was bringing, then they're going to hate you for everything that you represent. They're going to hate you because of Christ in you. They may not even recognize they hate you, but they hate you because you don't belong to them. Which means is you're not a part of the, you're not a part of their system. You're not a part of their world. And because you're not a part of the world, everything you do bothers them. When you're not when you're not a part of the world as a believer in Christ, everything you do it irritates them, it upsets them, and it bothers them, and it causes them to hate you, even when they don't realize that they're hating you. And what it is is because everything about your life as a believer in Christ, when you're lined up with the word, is this. You highlight everything that they're not you highlight everything that they're not doing. Does that make sense? So have you ever come into a class and you excel in that class and people start hating on you? And what they start doing is they start calling you a teacher's pet. They start calling you a know it all. They start telling you things like you think you know everything. You think you somebody. You think you better than everyone. You might have never ever said that or even came off that way. You just happen to be very intelligent, very studious, and you take your schoolwork seriously. And especially as a child of God, and God calls us to be excellent in all things, that's one area that you desire to, to glorify God in your academics. When you go that hard, everyone, real, everyone recognizes that you're doing more than they're doing. So because you're doing more than they're doing, it's highlighting that they're really not doing anything, or they're really not doing what they're supposed to do. And people don't like that because it makes them look bad, and no one likes to look bad. So by us living out the truth of what life is and us living out these different truths, it's highlighting the truth about people that they really don't want to realize. The same thing on a job. If you ever go to a job as a new person, and I'm going to tie this back into the body of Christ as well because this is something I learned as a true believer in Christ. So what happened is when you come to um, a new job, if you are a hard worker, there may be people who was at that job for a long time before you and you're doing everything you're supposed to do. You're going above and beyond. Because like you, that's just what you're doing. You, you, you're you working unto the Lord. Not just for the company. But at, unto the Lord. Just trying to glorify Him. What you'll notice is. A lot of other the co-workers. They'll start telling you things like. Oh you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. You're doing too much. Sit down sometime. Relax. Chill. Because what happens is. You start highlighting. Because you're, you come with that, that tenacity. Because you come with that faithfulness. And that diligence as a good steward of that job. What happens is you start highlighting what they're not doing. So if you're highlighting what they're not doing. Then they're going to hate you for that as well. And the whole purpose of that is. It's not to outshine anybody. And it's not to. To try to put anybody else down because the focus is not doing things to make other people look bad. The focus is not doing this to make yourself look good. The, fo the focus of doing this is to glorify God. Because if we identify ourselves as believers and we live in a way that glorifies Christ, if we're excellent in everything we do, then it's not just them saying, oh, this is a hard worker. Oh, this is a good person. This is such and such and such. That's a Christian woman. That's a Christian man. Like, you know what I'm saying? Boom. So they start glorifying God. You know what I'm saying? And that's why we have a lot of bad reps against believers in Christ now because there's so many people who claim to be Christian who do completely opposite of the word of God, which causes them to blaspheme the name of God and causes them to look at Christians in a slighted view when real Christians live a certain way. So what happens is the same thing happens in the body of Christ where we're fresh to the faith. We have a, we have a, a strong walk with God. We, um, we're praying. We're fasting. We're, we, we just want to be clean from everything that the, that we was in the world. We want to be separated from all the sin and everything. But somehow someone comes along and says, it doesn't take all of that. It, like, you don't have to do all of that. It's not that serious. Like, you're taking God too serious. God is a loving God. He wants you to have fun. He wants you to do all this other stuff. Yeah, God is a loving God. And yeah, God does want us to enjoy life. But there's a way that God wants us to enjoy life. As a believer in Christ, there's a way that God wants us to submit to Him. As a believer in Christ, there's a way that God wants to obey Him. So, what happens is, when we come into the body of Christ and we're going hard for Christ, it highlights to other people where they are slacking in their walk with Christ. So it, it all works out the same way. And um, I don't know how I got over there, but just to kind of bring it back into how it connects back to 
like dealing with these atheist professors. It all ties back into, I, I got there because I started off by saying that like, in what the scripture says, they hated Christ. And Christ told us that because they hated him, they would hate us. And so I just use those examples to show how it kind of, how it correlates and how it goes together. You know what I'm saying? So when we live out the truth of Christ, it, it just innately, people just see what they're lacking. You know what I'm saying? Or people see something that they feel like they want to have, but they feel like they can't get to it. And that's the purpose of us as believers in Christ is to show them that there is a way for them to get what we have. Because that's why Christ came and died. So that we could give people, um, so that we can give people the truth about Christ the same way that God sent others to give us the truth about Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit. So, um, with that being said, um, I kind of go into like the other little story I had about the, the, the last atheist professor I dealt with. Um, and this is me more believe, like more faith, um, more firm in the faith. And it was actually a religious class. So I came in there and I was like, man, I was like, I'm about to go hard for Jesus. Like, cause I got my Jesus shirt on now. I don't, I think this is the first shirt I wore in there. And I was like, every time I go into class, I got to make sure I have on a Jesus shirt. Like, he going to know I'm a Christian because I know he's going to try to he, he going to try to slay Christians. He, like, he's going to be in there and everything he's going to do. If he's not a believer in a religion class, that means he studied all these other religions. And so he probably has all these theories and philosophies about how Jesus uh, resembles different stories and all this other stuff. But there's still a lack of understanding that only comes from God. Um, there's an understanding that only comes from God to help us deal with those situations because, yeah, there's so much knowledge out here and there's so much confusion, but confusion, God God is not the author of confusion. So when all of that confusion is present, that's how you know that God is not in it because when God is there, he clears up the confusion because God is the truth. And confusion comes from a bunch of lies and mis um, and misinterpreted misinterpretations and just flesh. You know what I'm saying? It's just, that's what it is. It's just a bunch of mess. It's a bunch of flesh. It's a bunch of confusion. Um, but anyway, so I was like, yeah, I'm wearing my shirts, my Jesus shirts. I'm coming in every day. I'm going hard for Christ. Like anything you say against Christ, I'm going against it. All this, this, that, and that. Blasey, blasey, blasey. Boom. I'm going hard for Jesus. Yeah. So I get in class and the man immediately starts blaspheming Christ. He just starts blaspheming Christ, blaspheming Christ. So, being the believer I was at the time, like just as a moment, because it was different than the first time I encountered an atheist professor. I just raised my hand and I started presenting information. Like, okay, well, you say this about Jesus, but how was that true? Or how do you believe this is true? So I started asking him questions because one thing I learned from studying Christ is when Christ would deal with people, he used, like he would teach, but at the same time, he would ask questions because sometimes it's better to, to engage in a conversation like that with someone by asking questions because the Bible teaches us to be quick to listen but slow to speak. And the Bible teaches us that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when you want someone to start talking, you ask them questions. And if you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you in your questions, what it's going to do is this, um, the Bible teaches us that is God is the one who searches the hearts of men. So if the Holy Spirit is within us and the Holy Spirit is leading us to ask these questions, these questions that we ask are going to allow us to hear what's truly at the heart of that atheist professor or the non-believer that we may deal with on a daily basis. And the reason it's important to hear what's on their heart is because what's at the core of their heart is the root of everything they're dealing with. You know what I'm saying? So even with us. Sometimes we have to check our words because our words will show us where our heart really is. And sometimes we don't always know where our heart is at because the heart is deceitful, but the heart can only be deceitful to you. Like, my heart can't deceive you. You know what I'm saying? My heart can only deceive me. Does that make sense? So we have to ask God to show us these different things. But a lot of times, like, we, we can recognize it in the things that we talk about. And it's the same thing with other people. So it's like when we're dealing with the atheist professor or different people, we get these conversations. When we hear what's at the core of the heart, then that's when it's our responsibility to take that to God in prayer. So if, if your professor seems like they have some type of bitterness or unforgiveness towards God, then we, need, we know that in our prayer time and in our prayer closet, we need to be praying for our professor that God will heal whatever it was that caused him to have that hurt and that anger and that bitterness towards him. 
We need to ask God to restore their mind for whatever Satan used to deceive them or to try to push them away or get them to block God off and to try to keep them from receiving the love of God. So the important thing is to get involved in these conversations because as we get involved in these conversations, we can hear what they're saying. We hear what's on their heart and we can hear from God and how to um, how to navigate through that on the spiritual side before we... Um, because the battles, the battle is one in it's it's one in the spirit. You know what I'm saying? Our warfare, is, our weapons of warfare are not carnal, or they're not carnal. Excuse me. So we pray and we fast, and we pray and we fast for those for those professors and those non-believers that we interact with on a daily basis. Because it's only God who can open up their eyes to see, and it's only God who can open up their heart to receive the truth of Christ. So if there's something there that's blocking them from that, then we have to be the one that stands in the gap and pray and ask God for him to be merciful and gracious towards them as he was to us and to open them up and give them chance after chance after chance to receive that salvation. Sad thing is, some people still will reject God even when he opens up their eyes to, to, to see who he is. But we still pray and we still fast and we still do what we're supposed to do as we uh, to our personal responsibility as a believer in Christ and as we pray for the um as we pray for them and continue to live our life in a manner that glorifies God then it starts chipping away at the hardness of their heart so um so as I was in that class I would ask questions and have discuss um have discussions and then um after about a week God told me to be quiet and to not say anything so, uh, of course, I went back and prayed because I was like, I just wanted to make sure. I was like, come on, God. Like, this man is talking like mad junk about Jesus. And you want me to be quiet. You know what I'm saying? So, it's like I had to really seek God and make sure I was hearing from God on that. Because I thought that I was just supposed to be in there. Like, yo, Christ is in here. Christ is in me. This is what it is. So, what happens is when God told me to be quiet, I, I couldn't believe it. But, and I didn't understand why, and one thing that God was showing me is the fact that he never told me to do all of that in the first place. Like, he never, he never told me to go in there and start running off at the mouth and, and, and going as hard as I did. Because what, what I was doing without realizing it is I was causing people to shut their ears to the truth of Christ because of the, the, the conversations I was getting in. So what happened is everyone in the class ended up labeling me as one of those Christians. <laughs> so what happens is when everyone labels you as one of those Christians, then no one wants to listen to you. You know what I'm saying? Because, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, they view you in a certain way to where they're not receptive to anything. And I even learned um, from the professor that when I first got there, he thought I was one of those Christians. So God told me to be quiet. And so I was quiet for like a week or two. And one thing that God was instructing me to do, which is why when it comes to dealing with like these um, atheist professors and things like that, it's really important to me too when God and really listen to God and ask God to give you direction on how to do it. Because had it not been for God, I probably would have failed that class because I probably would have made a disconnect with the professor and a disconnect with the, um, the classmates. And I probably would have acted in a way that was just without like thinking zealous without wisdom, thinking I'm going hard for God, but really I'm acting ignorant. You know what I'm saying? So... Just being silent and eventually God started opening up the door where, you know what I'm saying, certain things would come up and there would be certain discussions where I wasn't the first one to say something. I would listen for what everyone else had to say. Then I would add my comment here. I add my comment there. I started becoming wise as a serpent, but being gentle as a dove. Sowing seeds here, sowing seeds here, sparking conversation. So it wasn't just me combating the teacher. It became a whole class that even those who had some understanding of Christ or those who didn't really know Christ where it was raising up valid points and poking holes in that flawed uh, philosophy of of, of of false religion, it poked enough holes, the truth of Christ was poking holes in all of that, that caused the other classmates in the classroom to start having questions of their own. But had I continued to be one of those Christians, or just being one of those people that always had something to say and was always becoming being argumentative, then what happened is I would have stopped what God was trying to do in that class. Because sometimes... It's not for us to take it upon ourselves to try to fight the battle that God is already fighting. And what we can we find ourselves doing that sometimes and it does more harm than good. We find ourselves trying to pull up the tear from the wheat, but what we what we don't realize is is only God has the precision to pull up wheat, um, to, to separate the tear from the wheat. Because how did, like I don't know if you know, but when weeds grow, 
weeds grow and they like what weeds weeds are like parasitic. So if you have a flower and there's weeds around it, the reason you have to um to pluck the weeds out the uh, out of the garden bed is because the roots of weeds they entangle themselves with the roots of flowers because they're trying to rob their nutrients. So if you go out there and you don't know what you're doing in the garden and you just start pulling up weeds without realizing it, you're pulling up the roots from the flower too. So you're killing the flower, trying to kill the weed. And sometimes as Christians, that's what we find ourselves doing without realizing it is we start trying to pull up the tear. And by trying to pull up the tear, we pull up the weed as well when God never told us to do that. So just to look at that. Let's find that scripture. Um, I think it's in Matthew. Let me see. Um, sorry, guys. Let me see. I know it's in here. Okay, yeah. It's in Matthew chapter 13, and it's verse, verses 24 through 30. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain has sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us to gather to do you want us then to go and gather them up? Verse 28 is key because this is what a lot of us do as believers in Christ. God, do you want us to go and do your work? No, oh, excuse me, not do your work, but do you want us to go and gather up the bad stuff and separate it from the good? He said, But he said, No. That's why you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first Gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So what Christ is telling us is this. We have to learn how to rest and just trust God and understand that he's in control. When the scripture says, be still and know that I'm God, it means be still and know that God is God. Be still and recognize that God is the one who's fighting these battles. And sometimes if we, if we, if we overstep our bounds or if we step out of our lane or if we step out of pocket or we step out of anything that God has told us to do, what we find ourselves is now we're outside of God's will. And when we're outside of God's will, we're doing things our own way. And we become displeasing to God because it's almost like um, it's almost like if you're on a team and everyone is, is running this one play, but you decided to just, I don't know, you decided to just run your own play while the whole team is running another play. You messed up the whole play because you wanted to do your own thing. And so it's the same thing. So even when it, within these classrooms... Um, that's how we ought to conduct ourselves and not get caught up in the fact of, oh, because I'm a believer in Christ and they're not a believer in Christ, it's my mission, it's my duty to come in here and combat everything that's said, everything that's done. No, that's not it. You know what I'm saying? Our, per our primary responsibility is to first make sure that we're solid enough in our faith that when these religious spirits and these false doctrines and these, and these spirits of confusion come out, that it doesn't hinder us. So we need to be in prayer hard when we're in those classes. We need to be in God's word hard when we're in those classes because those classes have a strong spirit that if you are not on point in your word, if you're not on point in your prayer, and if you're not in tune with God like you need to be, it has the potential to pull people away. You know what I'm saying? The Bible even talks about it. It, it warns us about the last days. Like, like if possible, even the elect will be deceived. So that's something that's in the world now. And then now you have it on college campuses where they're teaching these different things. And it's not just religious classes, but it's a lot of different classes. Even down to the elementary school level, now the things that they're exposing people to. You know what I'm saying? So what happens is we have to be on point. Like that's our primary responsibility because we give an account of ourselves before God. Am I on point? Because if I'm not on point of where I need to be with God, if, if like, like then it affects other people indirectly because I may not be in position to be used by God to the capacity that he desires to use me to reach other people around. So when it comes to that class with that atheist professor, that's as small as it could be. Where God just needs you to be on point in your personal life so that you can be in tune and hear from him so that you can be the one that sows those seeds of righteousness and, um, and those seeds of truth in the midst of those conversations that are happening in the classroom. But if we're not open to hear from God, if we're not on point with God, and we're missing those opportunities, then what we're doing is we're, we're, we're hindering the work of God. So 
by saying too much, we could be doing damage. And then by not saying anything, we're doing damage as well. So we need to be strategic and just be understanding of God and say what God tells us to say and nothing more. You know what I'm saying? Because when God tells us to say something, there's a purpose for it. The Bible talks about not adding on to the word. You know what I'm saying? There's a reason for that. Because when God gives us something to say, I don't care if it's three words. God knows that at that moment, those three words hit somebody in a way that he needed to be hit. But if we take those three words and we turn it into 20 words, those three words get lost and they lose their significance. You know what I mean? So anyway, so what happened with the class is as we started, as I was praying for them as the, the professor and as I started having these conversations and God started um, using me to spark these conversations in class, what happened is where the professor was the one doing the attacking, he now was the one who was becoming attacked, right? But this is this is this is what was tight about it, cause let, let, this is how this is how God works. So in the midst of that, God told me to go ahead and start talking to the professor, because the way that the professor was trying to make a mockery out of, of any believer in the, um, in class, or try to make a mockery out of God, and try to make fools out of the believers in um, in God, and try to make what was said be foolish, then what happened is it put him in a position where everyone ended up shifting against him. So when everyone shifted against him, he felt alone. You see where I'm going with this? So as he felt alone, he felt like he had no one on his side. Here comes this 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 person that he dubbed as one of those Christians that came up and just had a conversation with him after class. Had a conversation with him. Left. Next class came back, didn't say anything. The whole class, talking junk, coming at him. Like arguing with him. He's feeling the pressure. He's feeling the stress. You can see the stress on his face. He doesn't know what to do. Class lets out. I go up. Ask him how he's doing. Talk to him. Leave. So what happens is the the one that the one that was that he had dubbed as someone that he didn't want to interact with when he felt alone, God allowed me to begin speaking with him and having conversation with him. So it got to the point where even though he didn't really, he didn't believe in Christ or he didn't believe in the truth of the Bible, what happened is he became receptive to having conversations about God that he might have not otherwise had conversations about um, with anyone or, or even uh, like the, the opportunity wouldn't have been there for me to have those conversations had it been like, had I just been that belligerent person that was just always had something to say. You know what I'm saying? And so at the end of the day, I just had to learn how to be strategic and pick the battles that God told me to 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 walk into. You know what I'm saying? Not overstepping what God wanted me to do, not understepping what God wanted me to do, but just being obedient to God and really led by his spirit as far as how to handle that situation. And what God ended up doing in that is God ended up giving me favor. Um and there was a specific book. I'm not gonna get too much into that because I don't want people to like be sl to like swayed over there. But there's a specific book that this professor had latched on to, and there was a book that he kept wanting to present to everyone. And so one thing that I was thinking, I was like, okay, God. I said, I know how I'm gonna reach this man. I said, I'm going to write something. I'm gonna write something concerning this book that he's latched on to that mentions Christ, but not all the way, you know what I'm saying? Because I like the the book had enough to where you could tie it in and show how it confirms the truth of the Bible. This, this is how God worked it out, right? Two weeks after, I was like, okay, God, this is what I feel like, like this is what I feel like God was sharing for me to do. The professor actually made the, the, the idea that God had given me an extra credit assignment. So not only was I going to be able to do what God had wanted me to do, but I was also about to get extra credit for it. And so I did the paper and everything, and the guy was actually pleased, and he said, you did exactly what I hoped you would do with it, which was to make it real as far as what your stance is. And I ended up coming out of the class with an A. Um, but the reason I highlight the, the I highlight the last part of how everything went as far as like developing in our relationship with that professor and having those conversations is because there's times where we had conversations where I was able to present information to him that he otherwise may not have ever either heard 
or been um been open and receptive to hearing. So when it comes to dealing with atheist professors, the the number one thing we don't want to do is we don't want to just become that person that just is on kill mode because that's that is ineffective evangelism. And this goes beyond now now this right here just goes beyond the classroom. It's not just in the classroom. Like, yeah, there's atheist professors, but there's non-believers who are in our lives daily. And the same way we don't just go in straight kill mode with that non-believing professor, it's the same way we don't do that with anybody. You know what I'm saying? The only time we really come at it like that is if there's someone who professes to be a believer in Christ, but their life isn't lining up. Because the Bible teaches us, Paul said, like, those who are without, like, those who are outside of body of Christ, like, God has already judged them. Like, they're already condemned. So... Our responsibility is to 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 just walk in love and be who God calls us to be to that person to open to be receptive to the truth of God's word. And then whenever they finally decide to well, whenever God finally pulls them in to the body of Christ as it pleases his will, now we hold them accountable to the word. Because if they're not in the body of Christ, we can't really hold them accountable to something that they don't even believe in, something that they don't even accept. And when we do things like that, what happens is that's how you get a lot of people who are confused and think that they might be uh, that, that they might be saved, because we try to hold them and point out certain things to them according to the word of God, and they be like, "Well, I'm not doing this and I'm not doing that, so I'm good." And no, it's deeper than that, you know what I'm saying? But what happens is when we do ineffective evangelism, we create false converts, you know what I'm saying? Or we turn people off, or we push people away. If we went into people on campus or in our personal lives who claim to be believers in Christ and they play and they claim to read the word of God, then we can hold them accountable to this word. And that's when we go in straight kill mode. Like, well, some of them we, we, we are compassionate with, but some of them we say um, as though we snatch them from fire. So if they believe, they claim to believe in Christ, they claim to live by his word. If they're in error, we bring this word to them. And then that's when we let them know, like, no, you off, you wrong. But those who are outside the body of Christ, those who are outside the word, those who have no type of faith in Christ, there's a certain way that that God desires us to reach them. You know what I'm saying? And oftentimes it's through relationship. Though those conversations, because it's like when we get down those walls that they have set up against Christians and they stop seeing us as one of those Christians and they see us as a person, then what happens is they no longer just have a wall up where they don't hear anything you say. Now they view you as a person. And when they view you as a person, they see value in what you have to say. So because they see value in what you have to say, they're not receptive to anything that God desires for you to speak to their life. Even if it's for you to pray for them. Like, like they could go have a rough day. You mind if I pray for you? That can impact somebody. You know what I'm saying? They have an issue going on with their family and they decide to open up to you about it. Do you mind if I pray for your family? If they say no, pray for them in your private time anyways. And pray and ask God that, that whatever he does, he does it in a way they, that, they, that they know it was him. You know what I'm saying? But the, but the bottom line is we have to be in position so we can do the things that God desires us to do, whether it's with that atheist professor or whether it's with a non-believer or whoever that we're dealing with in our personal life. And um, on top of that, what we don't want to do is, because I know, I know there's, some, there's, some, there's some professors who just don't want to hear any of that. And there, there may be some situations where it starts affecting your grade. Um, but what I do want to like bring to your attention is everybody answers to somebody. You know what I'm saying? So even if it's a situation where they're messing with your grade, the first person you still go to is God in prayer. You know what I'm saying? And after you take it to God in prayer, you use wisdom. That professor has a boss. This country has given you rights. Like You have a freedom to express your belief. You know what I'm saying? So if they're trying to hinder your grade because of like you're writing you're writing an essay and you use a capital G to refer to God. You know what I'm saying? Um if they try to limit you from expressing your belief in class in the midst of a conversation, you know what I'm saying? But there's other people who have beliefs um as far as like different 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 faiths or different lifestyles or like different things like that. If they're not accepting of yours, but they're accepting of those, that gives you power um, in a legal sense where it's like if they're trying to use that against you, you they have a boss that you can go talk to. You know what I'm saying? So 
If you're dealing with that type of professor that just isn't open or receptive to anything, then that's what you do. Like you go, you 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 submit it to the proper authorities. You know what I mean? Because as you submit it to the proper authorities, then they can determine how to handle that professor. You know what I mean? But um, yeah, like that. That's just how you. That's how you deal with. That's the best way to deal with that. You know what I mean? Because a professor does have the power of your grade in their hands. So if they're doing something like that. You need to reach out to someone who has more authority than they do and bring them to and shed light on what's going on in that situation so that you have someone that has authority over that professor that can advocate on your behalf and can check, put that professor um, back in the correct understanding of their role as a professor, which is not to persecute you for your belief, but to actually just instruct the class and facilitate the class and be fair in the way that they grade your stuff the same way they are with others. But, um... Hopefully that makes sense. But so like but outside of that, if there's if there's one that is somewhat receptive, to just develop those relationships. Develop those relationships with your classmates, develop those relationships with your professor and get on the name basis with you where like where they know you by name. They know you they know your face, you know what I'm saying? Because as you get into these conversations, it will open up the door for you to not only minister to them but to also to be a light in the um to be a light in the classroom. So I think we're running low on time, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read these last two scriptures because the purpose is we have to make sure that we're not denying Christ and we have to make sure that in, in the midst of all of the stuff that we deal with with these non-believers, whether, um, whether it's in our classroom um, from a professor, whether it's from a family friend or anything like that, then what, we, what we're going to do is we have to hold firm to our faith. Because sometimes when we start getting into the, the uh, um, into these type of friendships and these um these relationships, not like boyfriend girlfriend type relationship, but just like these these levels where we're open to communicate with other people, sometimes what happens is we may become too relaxed to where we let our guard down, and some of the stuff that they're feeding us, we start taking on, and it's not correct doctrine or it's not the right stance on life. It's not a biblical worldview. You know what I'm saying? So that's why there's countless instructions in the Word. That teaches us that we need to um, we need to endure to the end, and we need to stand like we need to hold firm to the faith. So we're gonna read two scriptures, and then um, then I'm gonna pray us out, and then I'm gonna answer that question that just came up. All right, so it's Second Thessalonians, it's chapter two, and it's verses thirteen through fifteen. I hope this is making sense. It's different because I can't see faces. But sometimes it's actually better because when you see faces, people might be into it, but people don't realize they just have blank stares. <laughs> so, yeah. Alright, so Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. It says, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which He had to which He called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by our word, whether by word or our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace comfort your hearts and establish you in, in every good word and work. So verse 17 he says comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. And he's talking about what, what Christ does, what the Holy Spirit does in us. But in verse 15 he tells us to stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught whether by word or by our epistle, which means that everything that we've been taught um, from, from people that God has sent our way to disciple us, to mentor us, from pastors that lead us, from, from these different leaders in the church that have helped us understand the word of God, from things that God himself has spoken to us through our personal time in his word, and all of this, um, and all of the midst of everything that we, when we deal with atheists and non-believers is we have to stand firm to this word, because if we don't stand firm to the word, what we do is we begin compromising. And I want to share a scripture that's going to show the danger of compromising. Because, let's just go to Matthew chapter 10, 33. 
I'll start at 22. Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For surely I say to you, you will not have gone through the... Did I do this one right? Oh, sorry. It's verse 33. <laughs> all right. I start at verse 32. Sorry, Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33. It says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So a lot of times, a lot of we like to believe that means that you just say, Yeah, I believe in Jesus, that's confessing him before men. Or by saying, No, I don't believe in Jesus, that's denying him before men. You can deny Christ before men by the words that you speak and by the actions that you live. So the things that you do, like the words that you speak and the works that you do, can either confess your belief and your faith in Christ before the eyes of other people or it can deny, uh, deny your belief in Him. And so when we don't have a, a, a healthy biblical worldview and we're not solid in the Word of God, and as we start getting involved in these relationships, um, as far as like trying to trying to evangelize and things like that, if we're not solid in His Word, what we do is we start compromising the Word of God. Well, we become pleasers of men rather than pleasers of God. And by compromising the Word of God, what we don't realize we're doing is we're denying Christ in front of men, because the Word of God is Christ. Christ is the Word. He teaches that in John chapter one. It said the Word was made flesh. So if this was made flesh. And we know that the word, Christ is the word, then when we start denying the word and we start compromising the word of God for the sake of other people's feelings or the sake of how other people are going to look at us, what we're doing is we're denying Christ in front of them. Because we're presenting, we're now presenting them a false Christ. We're now presenting them a Christ that is suitable to what they want to believe. And that's not the real Christ. Christ doesn't conform to what people want him to be. Christ is who he is, God is who he is, and we are supposed to conform to his image, not him to ours. So when we compromise the word of God and we start conforming the word of God to what people desire him to be, then we are now denying him in front of men. Uh, amen. And what we're doing is we're causing, we become a stumbling block to other people. and We become a hindrance because we're not presenting them the truth. And because we're not presenting them truth, we're setting them up for failure. So, in all, in all in all, the whole purpose of this topic is just to understand, like, there's ways to deal with non-believers. So, atheist professors, um, atheist friends, or people who just have confusion or whatever, like, there's ways to deal with them. And a the way to deal with them is just really being in your word, really being in prayer, really being in fasting, and positioning yourself to be a vessel to be used by God. Because if you're not positioned to be a vessel to be used by God, more than likely you're going to be operating in your flesh. And one way that you'll recognize you operating in your flesh is it's not going to go as smooth as you think it is. You're going to take things into your own hands. You're going to do stuff that God never told you to do. And you're going to cause a whole lot of problems. And you're going to cause a whole lot of unintended consequences. Had you have just um, sat still and let God lead you, then you could have avoided those consequences. But because you took things into your own hands, started speaking out of line and started doing different things according to what you but what you felt was right and not what the Holy Spirit led you to do, then there's consequences that may come up that you may have to deal with. So we just want to be spirit-led in everything we do and really trust and have faith that God can pull us through that. You know what I'm saying? And like I said, if there is if it is if there is a um if it is a, a, a situation where a professor just isn't receptive to anything like that and they're just really coming at you, that remember the professor has a boss and there's someone that's over them that you can go to and report your complaint to and um as you report that complaint, then it it shifts the whole ball game. Um and and if even if if their boss isn't doing anything, there's other people outside of campus or people in your churches or whatever that you can get connected to that can help you um get some help in that situation. Um, if that makes any sense. Um, so yeah, that's 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 the topic for today. Um, the topic again was that atheist professor. Um, I know the topic was that atheist professor, and I touched on the atheist professor, but I also talked about pretty much just atheists and or non-believers in our lives in general. So um, what I want to do is I want to pray to close out the teaching. And then afterwards, um, we'll have a couple of minutes for, for questions because I saw somebody had asked a question. Um, yeah, and then um, 
I guess if you're watching this later, um, after it's already been recorded, then um, I guess just send send um, BCF an email and just about some questions or anything, um, and we can go from there. All right. Um, Dear Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, God, we just thank you for waking us up this morning. God, thank you for those who are able to tune in um, this early morning, God, and just thank you for even those who will be able to tune in when it's, um, it's showed again um, tonight. God, we just bless you and we worship you, Father God, and we just ask you to just be the first fruits of our day, God. We pray that you just um, pour out on us a fresh anointing, Father God, and just give us the strength and the joy we need to um, to make it throughout the day, Father God. And for those who will be coming on later, Father God, just give us the, um, the gratefulness we need for you to have brought us through another day, Father God, and just for the different testimonies which you have blessed us all with, Father. Let us never become ungrateful, Father God, and let us never forsake um our, our faith in, and our first love in you, Father God, or be consumed by the um the different distractions and I, um idols in our lives, God, um or that the, that Satan will try to present to us in the name of Jesus Christ, God. I pray that you just um allow every word that um was spoken, Father God, just to be good seed, Father. Everything that you desire to be good seed, Father God, just allow the hearts and minds of those who receive it to be fertile ground, Father God. Just allow the seed to be protected, Father God. Just rebuke anything Satan would do to try to pluck away any knowledge or understanding which you desire to give in the name of Jesus Christ, God. Just give your angels charge over us, God, and just allow us to walk through the day safely, God. Just allow your um, Holy Spirit to be a protective hedge around us, God. Just continue to manifest the fruits and gifts of the Holy Spirit in our, in our lives daily, God. Just give us the knowledge and wisdom we need to navigate through life, God. Give us favor um, with our bosses, God. Give us favor with our professors, Father God. And just allow us to be good stewards of the work which you have given us to do, Father God. Um, just allow us to continue to be a light wherever you have placed us at, God. And just let us never deny you. Um, even in the small things, Father, let everything always glorify you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. And um, somebody asked a question earlier. I want to answer that question. Um, yeah, so if any, does anyone have any questions right now? Okay, cool. So, there's no questions. But there is one question I saw earlier. Um, I can't remember. I can't remember exactly the, the complete question because I was trying not to read it because I didn't want to get distracted. But I know the question, it meant it, the question was asking something about how do you, um, how do you form those relationships with non-believers without crossing boundaries? Um, From what I've experienced to be the best, the best way to engage in those type of, of friendships or relationships where there's open communication without crossing the boundaries, the best way to do that is to, first you have to be solidified in Christ. Because it, 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 as crazy as it, I know it may sound cliche, but as, as cliche as it may sound, the, the truth that handles a lot of these situations is just knowing who you are in Christ, being solidified in Christ and really being led by his spirit, being in his word. That It takes being in his word because when you're in his word and you're having these conversations with people, then your your discernment will be on to be able to recognize, okay, when is a boundary being approached that shouldn't be there? You know what I'm saying? So if there's a non-believer, it doesn't mean you have to hang around them 24-7 to reach them. Because we have to remember, first and foremost, you're not Jesus. Jesus is in you, and we're being conformed to the image of Jesus, but you don't save anybody. I don't save anybody. Christ saves people. You know what I'm saying? It says, like, no one comes to the Son unless he's drawn by the Father. So our job is just to be that vessel. We just allow the Holy Spirit to flow through us, and we bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit because the fruits of the Holy Spirit are different characteristics and aspects of God's love. So as we bear these fruits of the Holy Spirit, it allows people to taste of the goodness of God as we interact with them daily. So we don't have to be around them 24-7 feeling like us being around them 24-7 is going to get them saved. No, they're going to get saved whenever God deems it's necessary for them. He presents them that option, you know what I'm saying, and then they make a decision. And the reason I stress that is because I did it when I first started walking with Christ, and I still see other believers who do it to this day. 
where they we get I call it a God complex or a savior complex where we feel as if we're not around that person or if we're not their friend or if we don't hang with them all the time or talk to them all the time that they're not gonna be saved. And the whole thing with that is this. You have to trust God. If that all that comes back into what we talked about in the teaching, just being still and letting God be God. You be who God has called you to be and let him be who he is. Because he is God, not us. We're just a vessel. So as we allow ourselves to be submitted to God and just operate as vessels, then even if you only see that person that's a non-believer, but you have a friendship where you see them like once every other day for five minutes on your way to class, you're able to just give them a loving conversation, ask them how their day is. Because you'll be surprised how much, like that, that means a lot to some people. You know what I'm saying? Because people ain't asking how, how, their, how days are going anymore. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not saying that's the only way to do it. That's just as an example. But just the whole thing is recognizing who you are and understanding what the Bible says about what's appropriate and what's inappropriate, what's true and what's not true. And as you develop these, um, these lines of communication with people who don't believe in Christ, making sure that, um, that you yourself are remaining pure. But in, more, in, in order to remain pure, you have to remain in God's word because God's word is our shield. Like, it protects us, you know what I'm saying? The Bible teaches us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when the Bible talks about the armor of God, it calls the shield of faith. So, if the shield is faith, and faith comes by hearing the word of God, then that means that we need to constantly be hearing the word of God, constantly reading the word of God, and constantly studying the word of God, so that when we do interact with non-believers and, and get into like an evangelistic mode where we are communicating with them, it, it, it protects us and keeps us from crossing those boundaries or putting ourselves in a position where, where we slip or we fall. I don't know if that makes sense. And slipping and falling, I'm, that's, I'm not talking about like, like just like fornication or anything like that, like stumbling at any point with your walk because of who you're around. So, I, um, I hopefully that made sense. Um, I pray everyone was blessed. Um, for those who joined this morning, I thank y'all for, for waking up. Um, and I hopefully y'all pray before you start your day. And for those of you who are tuning in later and watch this in the evening, um, hopefully this blesses you as well. Um, and if you have any questions concerning the teaching, um, I don't know, maybe they'll do like a follow-up where you can ask some questions like a, a follow-up session or something. Um, how do you explain Jesus to someone who is an unbeliever? You have to make them personal. So, the way you explain Jesus to a non-believer is... You have to give them a parable. And an a easier like parable to me is like, like a parable is a parable. But in layman's terms or just basic terms, a parable is an analogy. So earlier we went to the scripture in 1 Corinthians um, um, chapter 2. And what it teaches us is that non-believers don't have God's Holy Spirit. So because they don't have God's Holy Spirit, they can't understand the spiritual implication or the spiritual explanation so when we explain Christ or when we, we have to explain him in a way that their natural mind will be able to will be able to understand. So one way to do that, and I'll just give you a, a story example. So this is this is a story example that I've learned that has been very like this very effective. This isn't the story you have to use, but this is just gives you an example of how you can take the spiritual the spiritual nature of who Christ is and and the spiritual implications of what he did through his death on the cross to make it hit home as far as to a non-believer so it's just it's a short story and it says okay so let's say let's say you are like you're just a bad person like you're just bad you do a lot of bad things you have anger issues and so you're living in texas they have capital punishment and capital punishment is a death penalty you have road rage one day. You're on the way home. Somebody cuts you off. And when they cut you off, you get mad. And you go and you shoot them or something like that. They end up dying. So in the state of Texas, if you're convicted of murder, then um, and they, they, like, they can sentence you to death. So you have road rage. You shot somebody. They died. Now you're on death row waiting to die. So the day that you're supposed to die, what happens is they blindfold you. They walk you. They cuff you up and everything. You have your last meal. 
Then they walk you into this room. They take your cuffs off. They take off the blindfold. They give you all of your belongings. They say you're free to go. Leave. And then you're sitting there wondering, well, how did I just get to go free? I was supposed to die. Like today I was supposed to die. Like this was my execution day. And then one of the guards lets you know that your twin brother or your twin sister that had never did anything, had a, had a wife, kids, had husband, kids, whatever, six-figure income, whatever, never did anything wrong, came in and confessed and said that the, the, the video footage that, that they had that was evidence against you, they came and confessed to, um, to it, and they, they, they got executed instead of you. And when you present it that way, what it does is it causes them to really think about how they would feel if somebody they loved as a brother or sister really died in a place when they deserved it death. So it, it so it starts making it more real to them. You know what I'm saying? And then you can do a follow up question question like, okay, so let me ask you a question. If you believe that your your twin died in your place, even though they did nothing wrong, you did it. If you believe they did that because they love you, how do you honor that? And nine times out of ten, the response is by changing my life. You know what I'm saying? Because if you ask them, would they go out there and keep doing the same stuff they got them in prison the first time? Most times they say no. They say because that's that wouldn't that would show that you didn't really care, or that would show that you didn't really love them, or really believe that like you just pretty much wasted the opportunity and the second chance that they gave you. Does that make sense? So. We take Christ and we take the spiritual things of the Bible and we have to present it in ways that are concrete that their natural minds can wrap around because it's like the more they start wrapping, the, um, gaining that natural understanding of spiritual principles, the more it opens them up and softens them up to become receptive to the truth of Christ and the truth of God's word. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. All right, so do um, you're welcome. Any other questions before I go? Going once, going twice. So, all right. Well, I thank y'all for tuning in. Um, if this bless you, share with other people so it can bless them. Um, keep following along to the back to school teachings on Periscope. Um, hosted by Bethel Campus Fellowship. Um, if you do get a chance, come see us at Proclaim November 18th at the Showplace Arena. Um, also, if you get a chance, check out the website, BethelCampusFellowship.org. Um, we have national conference coming up in February. Right now, we still have the, the normal rates before they go. I think they go up in a couple more weeks. So if you can, go ahead and get your tickets now. Um, it's an experience you don't want to miss. You have a, a ill encounter with God. Um, so, yeah, just man, bring some other people. But God bless y'all. Um, remember to pray and just really see God's face and just allow him to use you. And then you won't have to worry about atheist professors or other non-believers who try to shake your faith because God will equip you to to stand firm and remain um, steadfast in the end. All right. Um, I probably I can't say I'll see y'all later because I don't know. But peace. <laughs>